Amen. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we enter into uh, this day, Lord, with heavy hearts as we think about the sacrifice, uh, that sorrow that you carried deep within you, Lord, and we too open ourselves and focus ourselves um, and try and remember the way that you commanded us to remember that night um, in that room, that intimate meal, Lord, where you taught your first disciples what it would take to die and to rise again. So we come to hear from you now. In your name we pray. Amen. So as you just heard today, and you probably know well, we are all leading to what the whole Christian church since the beginning of the Christian church has led to. And so today we get to celebrate what's known as the Lord's Supper or uh, the Eucharist. And I love that, that word Eucharist. I am not a Greek scholar, but I read people that are smarter than me. And they uh, point out um, that um, this Eucharist is a, a Greek word that comes from the book of Matthew. And it's from where Matthew um, describes Jesus taking the bread and the cup and giving thanks to the Lord and then breaking it and then pouring it out. And so this Eucharist uh, can also be translated in the Greek as the good gift. And so the good gift is Christ's body broken and Christ's blood poured out for us. And there are a lot of ways to be tired. I don't know if you experience any of them. I'm sure that you do, in fact. Uh, one is to be physically tired, and uh, maybe you're running around all day long, and uh, maybe you work out probably more than I do, or uh, maybe um, you're just really busy, and you're interacting with people all day, and maybe you get to your pillow at night, and you're just so thankful for uh, the sleep that's going to come, or um, you can be mentally tired, like think about uh, that 17-year-old girl who just took the SATs and is coming out and she's just like can't think a thought, you know, just wants to go home and watch mindless television and not talk to anyone for some time. So you can be physically tired and you can be mentally tired, uh, but the tired that Jesus is describing and experiencing in this moment is a Eucharistic tired, a soul tired. And a soul tired comes from when you love something so much and you care for it so much that you pour yourself out so that that thing can live. Mothers know this really well, right? That they spend 24-7 giving and giving and giving. Think about the greatest book you've ever read or the best movie you've ever seen. Um, that was thousands and millions of dollars and hundreds of people all giving and giving and giving. And here's Jesus and he gives thanks to the Lord because he's poured out. He gives us the Eucharist. He gives of himself so that we can receive. So if you came today and you have a heavy heart, if you came today and you feel tired, emotionally, physically, but more importantly, spiritually tired, that you've been loving something and just giving yourself to it and giving yourself to it, then you've come to the right place because the rhythm of God 
unfolding in the Eucharist is that we would take the Eucharist in, take in the ultimate peace of God, body broken, blood poured out, so that we might too become the Eucharist for the people around us. And so we receive and then we give. This body broken, blood poured out for the healing of the whole world. And at the center of all of the Christian story, of all of the story of the world, is a table. And so many Christian worship services build to this table. This table that was built in a house of love. Um, in that text that Jennifer so beautifully read, um, it continues on um, in the book of John for four chapters of Jesus explaining to his disciples what it would take to suffer. And John, previous to this scene in the upper room, has used the word agape, love, eight times. And then when he gets into the, this upper room, he uses it 31 times. And so uh, we know that that table, imagine in your mind's eye that you're there. And I want to say, you are invited to sit in an intimate space with Jesus. And he begins to tell you what it's going to take to follow after him. And he uses the word love 31 times. The house of love is where God reveals that love takes sacrifice and it takes rest and it takes sacrifice and it takes rest. In fact, in the first line of this uh, story from John 13, 1, it says that Jesus was going to tell his disciples what love looks like in its fullest extent. You know, imagine love, every love song, every sonnet that was, you know, Shakespearean play, every single act of romance and service and care, nothing compares to Jesus coming to earth in the form of a man and sitting with his disciples and saying, do you want to know what love looks like if you stretch it out? If you stretch it out as far as it possibly can go. And then what does he do? To display love fully stretched out. He gets down on his knees. He goes to his disciples and he washes them. And then Peter <laughs> screws it all up again. And he says, ah, not just my feet, but my whole body as well. And there's that mix of, yes, he, he sort of understands, yes, he, he needs to be washed, but he's still trying to control it. He's still let, letting Jesus know, hey, this is about me. Why don't you do this for me? Jesus And Jesus is saying, no. Get the religion, get the control of me out of this. It is all about listening and receiving with an open hand and an open heart. And that's hard for us to do if we're really honest. That uh, I, I didn't necessarily, when I was in fourth grade, sign up for the suffering part of Jesus. I don't know if you did. I signed up for the candy bar, memorize a worship, you know, uh, uh, scripture Jesus, you know, and get a reward at the end of it. 
But then here, as we continue through Jesus' life, uh, we see that um, he's trying to build us to the point, he's building his disciples to a point, chapter 13, where they can actually understand that they're not just supposed to receive this gift of service, but that they're supposed to then turn and give this gift of service to the whole world, 12 men to the whole world, to teach us all what power actually looks like from God's point of view, as low as you could possibly go to love and to care and to create, I believe, a community of suffering that, let's be honest, they didn't get it. Jesus said, do you understand what I'm saying? And it's funny, he doesn't let them answer, right? He just continues to say, do you understand what I'm saying? This is what it means. You need to go out. You need to serve. Because what did Jesus know in that moment? It wasn't just Judas who was going to have a moment there where betrayal uh, was going to take place where suffering was going to come and they were not going to say with their Savior. And so Jesus knows that they haven't fully understood yet what he's doing at that table. The nation um, of God, the, the first people of God, these men that were sitting there, um, you know probably, is named Israel. And it's an interesting name if you think about it because those people could have been named anything. They could have been named, you know, something about love, something about peace. But they were named, and rightfully so, the community that struggles with God, that wrestles with God, that suffers with God, that God, uh, you know, took his people and he crafted them and he molded them and then he invited them to take up their own cross and empowered them to suffer, to not to suffer alone. We talk about suffering a lot um, as if, you know, we as people were, uh, if I knew a good song, you know, and I wanted to tell my friend about it, and I just told them all the facts. These are the notes. These are the lyrics. It's the best song ever. Just, just trust me. It's so great. And if I did that enough to you, you'd be like, can I just hear the song, please? Will you just let me hear the song? And I believe that's how suffering happens. When we suffer, we want to put language to something that no language belongs upon. And so uh, w what our job is when we come as a community that suffers is to listen, is to be quiet in that mysterious moment of emotion and not to try and go above suffering or below suffering but to go through suffering, to take the long journey together. And then I believe, have you met these people who've been through suffering and come out the other side of that thing? They have this entryway through that healed wound that is a divine conductor of God's grace. You know who's the best person to help somebody who's struggling with alcohol? A former alcoholic who's now sober, who can say, can you see my wounds? Every example you can think of, we all have them. We all have these wounds. And it's our job tonight as a community of suffering to open ourselves 
as Jesus opened himself to healing so that we might be the healer. We find the wounded healer and allow him to heal us so that we might heal for others and be the divine conductor of God's grace. We receive the Eucharist so that we might become the Eucharist. That is the invitation. All are welcome, not to a set of beliefs alone, but to a person at a table and a house of love who is saying there is a seat ready for you. Will you join me as we, we seek to heal and to love? Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for uh, your table, Lord, and uh, how you sat there, Lord, and um, said so many beautiful and wonderful things, and before you said any of them, you served, and you loved, and you washed the disciples' feet, and you covered those men in grace, and Lord, cover us now in your grace, Lord, and your forgiveness, and your peace, and Lord, may we receive this Eucharist so that we might give it to the world. In your name we pray, amen.